Can I, can, I, can I just say, just on the, the photo of the stuff, working in a rehab centre, we, if, if we can change the general perceptions of people, that'll include people that haven't had an injury yet. So if they've already got a sense of potential, then they come into rehab, that whole process is going to be shifted, I think, and massive. Yeah. Mm. I, I remember when I was coming through rehab, uh, it took one of my friend, good friends now, Richard, uh, to come in and talk to me and said, hey, here's all this cool, wonderful stuff that you could do. And, yeah, I was still going, you know, emotionally through the, through the through the ropes with, you know, coming to terms with a disability. But when I was ready, it was yeah. just, you know, the phone call was like, get me involved and just, you start one thing and then you just go on to doing a lot of great things. So that's a great starting point. Did it help you to know that there was that out there? Did that help you yeah. with your rehab uh, and preparation to know what you could absolutely. do? I think, especially for people who are very active prior to their injuries, mm. Um, it's just it's just a natural step to take, just just knowing that it, it's possible again. And once well, I remember once I saw these uh, off-road hand cycles, I think it was the Explorer, the, the first one that I saw, and the one that Dan's developing in Perth. Once I saw that, I, I was actually looking for an off-road wheelchair, and I, I saw the off-road trikes with the little levers. Like that. I thought, oh, that's cool. And then I saw the trikes, and I thought, no, that's it. Forget about everything else. I'm going back to mountain biking, and that, that was my thing. And, Everyone finds their passions, and I think it's a great thing that Campbell does um, uh, with with the Victorian Spinal Service. So, um, yeah, it, it's about finding what the individual uh, really is passionate about, and, and really um, catering for that. So I was following that. Uh, yeah. I know when I went through a rehab in 2004 in Vancouver, uh, Christian Bag actually had a website that he had that I would see was injured about four or five years ahead, of me. and mm. uh, I. Crip College. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, he's taking it down and said, or he's not taking it anymore. But it was just uh, images of what he'd gone through, what and how to transition back into his life um, as an active skier, as an active mountain biker. Even had a video of him going off the jump and having an accident because of a spinal cord injury, which was pretty full on. But uh, yeah, I know how to get out there. was really big driver to me, an active person, sleeping on by the before my advance, to jump back into it and say, hey, this is possible. What can I do? See somebody else pushing the boundaries first. And, you know, mm -hmm. that's really awesome for people mm -hmm. to see websites like this. Yeah. And yeah, just, it's it's just, just having that information there. Yeah. And once people know where that information is, it just opens the door up yeah. to a bunch of opportunities. Mm -hmm. Browsing the internet for mountain bikes while still in rehab the hospital. Fantastic. Great. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. so what? Five years ago, there was zero information about off-road hand cycling in Australia, and here we are, you know, three years on, and there's just a bunch of videos, uh, people with Facebook groups as well that we've, we've come up with, and it's just, yeah, it's just going to expand from there, and it's great to see associations like Man Biking Australia and all the um, state organisations getting on board as well and promoting it as well, so it's great to have people, other people talk about us as well, so it's not just... Where, you know, where these people in chairs just going, oh, look at us, look at us. It's, it's everyone else going, buying into it as well and just going, this is an awesome thing. And yeah. it, it really makes uh, things like, um, you know, providing accessibility in bikes and, and providing accessible uh, events and things like a lot easier for us, you know, instead of banging our heads on the wall all the time, you know, the other people are supporting it as well from the administration side of things. So, yeah. Um, let's go around a little bit. But, um, I'm a C4 bike. So I guess, and we come from an area of sporting background prior to New Mexico, I represent an Australian uh, club and uh, cleaned up while training. But I guess the biggest challenge that I've had is there's actually no sport available to me to compete. Mm -hmm. There's not a way. So I guess the focus that I would like to see is that it's about finding ways of people who have, who aren't just paraplegics, getting them included. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I'm very nervous, obviously, about, let's say I'm entering a competitive, uh, adaptive hand cycling yeah, race. It can be into I pedal with my feet. Yeah. And it's a question of, I, I feel very self-conscious. Like if, uh, when I entered the Giant Odyssey, I made the decision that I wasn't going to, no matter what happened, I wasn't going to win because I didn't want to show them that you know, I was using my legs. Maybe someone using their hands. So I guess the issue about it is it's got to really focus on inclusion as opposed to, and I think it will, but inclusion as opposed to competing. Yeah. Um, because that's the biggest 
uh, issue I found is there's nothing that I can do to compete. I can't, my arms don't move well enough to play butcher rugby or any of those things. Um, I guess that's just my contribution. No, absolutely really right. want to be about I'll say inclusion. two things about that. I mean, for me, the higher the disability, the more of a challenge it is and the more excited I get about something. So I'm trying to get a couple of the courts over and uh, Perth to get out there and join us and they're really enthusiastic but they just sort of don't know where to go to get the support, get the equipment, you know, get the events, so uh, things like that is great. But um yeah from an events point of view, you know, I really push that because that's the way to get the attention from all these associations. They see we're doing all this extreme two percent stuff. When they see that they go, Oh that's that's crazy, you know like when we saw that video of those guys going up there up the alpines and then back down again. Everyone just st- sits up and you know the head tingles at the back of your neck and go, oh cool, oh, I'm buying into it. And then we start that conversation, okay, well it's not just about that. It's 90% of people uh, who aren't going to be competing on an extreme level and it's really about that inclusion of, of more abilities. So yeah, I mean, I use that as, as a way to get people's attention and once I've roped them in, it's just like, all right, now let's have a serious discussion about inclusion and getting a range of people involved. There's an interesting, I'll just jump in here for a minute, there's an interesting thing that happened in Whistler. Remember I spoke earlier about the four-wheel gravity bikes at Whistler. Now Whistler were way ahead of the rest of the world in terms of downhill mountain bike and they came up with the first rack to put mountain bikes on their chairs and so on. Came up with the first rack to put quad bikes on the chair to stay them at the top. The four-wheel gravity quad bike was originally designed to be a participation by people with disability. What's happened now is it's become an inclusive downhill sport and there are now more people, more able-bodied people competing in four-wheel quad biking than there are people with disability. But everybody loves it because they're all competing on on an equal footing. It's just a new sport. It's a new sport. It's a new inclusive sport. And Mm -hmm. it wasn't intended that way, but it's grown into something really special. So Whistler has sort of done some groundbreaking work. It's like that inclusion spectrum where one of them was a sport that has been created specifically for people with disabilities and, uh, you know, over the time it's evolved and migrated into just this overall inclusion thing for everyone. Uh, so it's no longer something that, it will be nice to say, yeah, it's just our thing, but, uh, you know, for me personally, I like to think it's for everyone. And uh, we've actually got one guy in um, Perth who, you know, he's traditionally a marathon, ultra marathon runner, so he's been to Chile, he's been... He's doing, uh, you know, peaks in Antarctic and crazy things like that. And right. he wants to ride a hand cycle at Cape to Cape for four days and use his arms for a change. And you look at his arms, they're about this, this, <laughs> this thing. And, you know, it's it's, it's, other people are buying into it as well. And once we get other people buying into it, it just helps us push, push that. Into I still want that Red Bull challenge. <laughs> you yes. versus one of the, one of the um, yep. top outright contenders. Yes, uh, I forgot to mention on the photos, there was the, the mountain bike. Uh, which was adapted with the sit ski uh, mine in Ashton over in the UK, uh, yeah. formerly very uh, popular and famous for his, his stunts and tricks on a road bike, off road, mm-hmm. and things like that. And unfortunately, he had an accident. But if you look at the stuff he's doing, he's made he's made his own uh, a bit of equipment and tool. And you know, we'd love to have someone like that, you know, come to Australia and, and you know challenge challenge him in a way, and him you know bring some of his high end profile uh, athletes and really bring people, you know, get people interested and excited about it and again then we then we start that serious discussion of inclusion and how how we get about, you know, providing the accessibility that we need. And Andrew, you were talking before about having the rating system for the different tracks and stuff for mountain bikes and what we've started to do, and this is something that will be of use to people, yeah. mountain bikers as well, if you want to hold one of these up. We've started assessing the tracks where mm-hmm. our trail riders are, yep. and I talked before about the Sherpas, and so these will actually give you a grading mm-hmm. of the tracks of how many people you actually need yeah. as Sherpas for the trail riders, so these are also applicable mm-hmm. for those people using hand cycles as well, so mm-hmm. keep an eye on our website, because mm-hmm. these haven't been launched yet, but they will get rolled out across the state in the next couple of the, years. This is the information we need, you know, for people just starting out, where do I go, you know, you, you get your maps, they're accessible, and then you go to a place and you don't, you don't get lost, I know it's very easy, you know, when, when you start at, you know, a main point, you've got five veins of trails coming out, and you're just like, oh, it's good to have those little signposts, mm-hmm. and you've got all your mountain biking stuff, your international ratings, and bam, you've got the accessible stuff that you need, and straight away, someone that's, you know, has a disability identifies it, 
and they go, this this is the trail that I'm supposed to go on, so it reduces the risk of someone going down the wrong trail. So, no, this is this is great to see, and very similar to the trail rating uh, walking system that we have from WA, not for adaptive mm-hmm. equipment, but just uh, regular walking. And I think, um, yeah, they have got one for wheelchairs, but not for the mm-hmm. higher end um, terrain stuff. Yep. So this is a really great step forward. This is the sort of stuff that we really need to advocate for. Mm. Well, what I'm hearing is that there are quite a lot of different things happening in this, that you're doing some stuff, Parks Victoria doing some stuff, I'm sure different groups are doing things and I think one of the things that I think would be really great to see is to get all of those groups together and agree to a, a common language because otherwise you're going to have to try to work out wherever you go, there's something different. Wouldn't it be amazing if we could get those groups together and people together to hash out something that's applicable nationally? Or internationally? There sort of is. Back at the World Parks Forum, which was at the end of 2014 mm-hmm. again, if anyone knows about the World Parks Forum, it happens every 10 years, about 5,000 delegates. Um, we presented that menu. We have started, and there's a registration form on my website under the resources tab again somewhere. We've actually started, we've got about 12 names now from various parts of the world of people that have downloaded the manual and expressed an interest in forming taking a bit longer than we thought it was going to take. But John Kenwright and myself have agreed to facilitate an orchestra, like my, a like-minded group on trail grading and that sort of stuff, right. just, okay. to, just to discuss in the early stage, because no one's got a methodology yet. Mm-hmm. And there's lots of people playing in the space, and it'd be nice if it was as recognisable as the ski system mm. trail grading was written at some point. And just the ability to share information about yes, experiences. Absolutely. Yeah. I just got my Explorer in um, November, and the first thing I did in the first weekend was head up to Mount Buller and I tried a green run. And hey, that's that's awesome. That went fine. Well, there's a blue run, and yes. it was supposed to be Australia's only Iamba epic mountain bike trail. And I very quickly learned how off cam how off camber and narrow is too off camber and narrow for mm-hmm. uh, an Explorer to be able to lower them to have some serious crashes. So. Just to be able to share that information. Yeah, yeah. That's right. if, if we can come up with some sort of way where we get this information from different states as well, feed it through one channel to this international forum, uh, you know, it saves us all, you know, shouting. Mm-hmm. We just unite together with one voice and really present that information. And if someone wants to take that over as a different thing, you know, we've just agreed to start it and, yeah. uh, and to collect it. But Whoever wants to run with it, it's... Because it's different, like mm-hmm. different perspectives, what you need for running events and what you need for mm-hmm. accessible tourism yep. and, you know, wheelchairs versus um, hand cycles. They're all different, but there's going to be some... It would be great to get some common language around it and mm-hmm. get a group together to go, with all these different perspectives, is there a common common terminology or a common assessment tool that could be come up with? Um, and, and, by the way, that gate problem we're talking about, the, the, the things to stop the motorcycles going, I know for a fact that Don and Chris are grappling with the same problem in Alberta. I know parks British Columbia are, are grappling with it. Parks New South Wales are grappling with it. John's playing with. We're all trying to come up with a solution to stop the motorbikes getting in, but allow. So sooner or later, it'd be nice if there was a a world solution to it. Swipe card with an electronic lock. Embedded <laughs> yeah. tags and your wrist. Yeah. Well, it doesn't have to be surgically. There's commonalities of issues. Mm. Yeah. Mm. How, how often are these uh, forums on World World Parks? We really haven't kicked it off yet. There's, yeah. a, there's a lot of expressions of interest and there's a bit of swapping. I think the thing that's really going to kick it off mm. is when Donna and Chris release those plans. So I must chase them up and see where they are. Yeah. Because I, I know the guys in the US in terms of adaptive mountain biking are also trying to develop something as well. So yes, they, to, they are share, yeah. It's but they're not. So they, they they won't be part of this group. So okay. Yeah. So we're going to try to find a way to create a, maybe maybe we can take a lead and you know we've got a whole different we've got all the different groups really together here in one room at a national level. So maybe as I mean, a way to. I'm sort of counting. You know, at least four people with an array of experience just in Victoria and around and. We can get someone from each state to, you know, to organise their own little groups and get feedback, and then they filter to someone in Australia, and that person, adaptive mountain biking, you know, corresponds with you know World Bikes Foundation, any other trails or forums. I think I thought of perhaps a more streamlined approach would be um, as if we're talking in the context of an adaptive mountain bike association. Let's call it that for now. 
wouldn't that most logically sit under Mountain Bike in Australia? They would have, I mean, there's already a national body there, it's, it's ready to roll. Um, and to have an adaptive subsection, what would be the, the right terminology? Working group or Working group committee. Working group committee advisory. Yeah, support on the enormous resources of, um, of the association already. And then to have uh, to have a, a, a committee of some sort there would make more sense to me. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, you know, we've already started that process and trying to get some um, guidelines and standards around trail construction and design, and that you know may include bits and pieces around signage. Um, we will take the Embo, the current roading system for trails, and incorporate that into the, the standards or guidelines. Um, but we, you know, we need to go back to the community. We need the trail builders and the clubs and the mountain bike community to take ownership and be involved in the process of delivering the end product. Um, initially, the idea was some standards around mountain bike trails was not received very well in the, in the mountain bike community because it was this whole idea of you're going to pigeonhole all the trails, you're going to take away the creativity that trail builders bring, bring to their, their work. Um, but that's changed in 12 months. So the landowners in particular are looking for some sort of um, recognised guideline standard that they can feel comfortable that the trail that has been constructed either by themselves or by a club, because it loves to be on trails in, in Australia, is to some certain standard. So, you know, there, you know, there could be the, the opportunity to sort of incorporate all this work that we're talking about um, into, you know, some sort of you know, collaborative mm -hmm. approach to coming up with it. To, to add to that, uh, for example, in WA, it's the clubs putting in, you know, standards for signage and, and trail building, and it's Parks and Wildlife who are <coughs> waiting for those standards to be you know, finalised so they can prove it and therefore more trails are going to get built and upgraded and so mm -hmm. forth. And yeah, I, I don't know about things being pigeonholed, you know, I still think there's still going to be room for people to be creative and fantastic. It just might mean it not, might not be a sanctioned trail or something like that, it might be on a private property where there's another agreement with man biking clubs or whatever. So and we certainly don't want, you know, the trails to be pigeonholed. I mean, that, that's the reason we, exactly. we, we like this sport is the diversity and the different experiences and the riding of different trails in different locations we don't want the experience to all be the same so you know that that was a hurdle that that we had to um, sort of overcome or wait to to sort of subside in the mountain bike community you know, particularly around the professional trail builders so um, that seems to have gone through a natural evolution and they're all sort of changing towards you know the, the other way and when you combine that with a professional certification and, and a mountain bike trail um, mm -hmm. Construction, where we've got something to back up that process. Mm -hmm. um, um, you know, it's got a lot more people wanting to know how to or have qualifications of building mountain bike trails, but there is nothing, there is no qualification. You know, mm -hmm. you've got to take the wing route in Australia at the moment, you know, to, to be qualified as a mountain bike trail builder. You know, so, mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's just that go to that process, which is not. In terms of trail building, is I'm trying to see if there's a link between the Trail Builders Association and um, DSA's reference group ability to sort of coordinate that in conjunction with one another. Is, is that a possibility? Look, I sort of see that there's, and this may be my complete ignorance in how mountain bike stuff, but what I'm hearing is there are some trails that are built specifically like the, you talk about the trail builders and they're building a specific course, particularly whether it's for a specific event or whatever. Then you've also got existing um, properties like national parks and other stuff. So it's not just stuff that's built specifically for mountain bike and it's not just mountain bike. Even though mountain bike is what we're talking about here, I see it, you've got the opportunity to build something a little bit broader than that, that that crosses over a few different things in terms of rating. And maybe a part of it is to do with mountain bike specifically and part of it is more generally about you know, all of the other infrastructure and, you know, the, the B, A, B, C, D that you have in your thing. Um, I'd be happy from a national body perspective to, to be part of or to help coordinate bringing in the mountain bike, the tourism, the, the, the states, the different stuff and, and be that coordinator if, that, if that's useful. Mm -hmm. Happy to look at um, being an active part in that or if, if that's, if the appetite is that we're the best ones to coordinate that, um, then certainly in the first instance we can do that. Um, we're looking at working in partnership with Mountain Bike Australia anyway um, and looking at what that might look like so you know that can be part of our collaboration anyhow so really we, we, we don't want to 
jump in, but we're happy to, to help if we're the most logical ones to, <laughs> to sort of kick it off and then potentially to then link in with other international groups where the international memberships of a range of things anyway. Like, so up to you guys what you like. Uh, from speaking from Disability Sport and Rec, I mean, we obviously provided the site for today's gathering and, and we're more than welcome and interested about playing an ongoing role as a mm. leading a venue for us being a, a participant in, in a group that's more Victorian sort of mm. focused. Um, obviously, some great work's already been done by Parks Vic and, mm. and others, so we're, we're keen to be part of that journey and mm. we potentially, although Parks Vic have equipment, we also have an equipment library that we're continually expanding. Um, and there may be some other types of equipment that we could add to our library that adds to, to the, the, the requirements of the people who are interested in this sport. So we're interested in being part of the, the solution for this as well. So that may be a, a Victorian example that then might be able to be replicated in other states. That's right, you could actually form within Victoria, you've got Disability Sport Rec, you've got parks, you've got you know, your mountain bike contacts here, you've got what Campbell's doing, you've got you know, travelability, you've already got your nucleus of a state-based group really mm -hmm. here in the room, haven't yeah. you? Yeah. Which is great. I mean, we do, we do summer and winter camp, so we do a winter camp that's coming up soon at Falls Creek for, for adaptive snow sports, so that could easily be uh, an adaptive yeah, summer, that, like, summer, summer version. Yeah. And so yeah. that yeah. might be a great example to trial it and to get what some new participants idea, to right, come camp. on board. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, we're, mm -hmm. So we're, we're more than interested to be yeah, a fantastic role. Accessibility really interested in doing that. I think DW won't have accessibility I think they're, they're yeah. potentially yeah. We're trying to get Sven uh, down, uh, the operations manager. Um, I think he's stepped up Sven's in his work. He's he moved on? Okay. Wherever the next one is. might be a little while while they resettle. Uh, yeah. They're, they're, really they're going through some changes. Yeah. So. Uh, Tom's a new guy. 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 Tom's a new and uh, there we had a group that was loosely revolved around wheelchair racing, but essentially we had a pool of equipment yeah. um, from donations and from uh, government sources, and that's where I got access to it went off to have my first kind of experience with it, could actually uh, give it a try, take it out for a week, you know, go do yeah. some of the, the mm -hmm. trips to the Rockies and fall in love with the sport before dropping the more than I spent on <laughs> uh, most of my cars um, yeah. on, uh, on a mountain. <laughs> and, and, and that's exactly the far away selling my way yeah, yeah. 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 And, and at the Talbot, it comes down to borrowing people who have made that commitment, yeah. unfortunately. But if there was a pool of equipment, I mean, yeah. I ended up getting my Pinko one off because there was none around, and you know, that was a good excuse, and I could become a Wi Fi. You know. But um, without, without that, you know, no, there's nothing people would try, and it doesn't progress. But you know, now you've know, got a, a four or three and a, a trike and you know, it's, it's, we're starting to get numbers but they're still only people's ones, but if we have program ones that people can borrow. Mm -hmm. it's There's it's a couple. So I was just going to say, you guys have got some here, Parks have some, it would be great to be able to sort of have a list of who yeah. has what equipment. Yeah. And we're always adding more to it than the Parks Vic Rental. Yeah, well. um, and like if that information can come from the state group, then we could replicate that with each of the states that we gradually yeah. work with and actually start yeah. to be able to, when you go onto our website and you look at adaptive mountain bike, you can actually then go and say, Victoria, where do I get equipment? Mm. Boom, boom, boom. That, that would be just really great. Mm -hmm. And in terms really of that state group, group the two yeah. missing bits are the, are the is local government, mm -hmm. so I manage a lot of public land, and state government that is in Parks Victoria management, so state forests yeah. mm -hmm. and places like that, so they really need to be brought into the conversation now, as well. There's an opportunity, and I think it's one, as an industry generally, we're not going to do that, but there's a real opportunity for mountain biking, especially in places like Borbor. Does everybody know of Michael Walker from the Department of Sport Bike? Yeah. Now Michael got, Michael's got a pocket full of money, okay. and that one. needs to be tapped. Places like Borbor, for instance, is a pretty good place for off-road hand cycling because the car park's dead flat. You're right there, you're right on the top of the Alpine Resort. 90% of Borbor's revenue, which is the most climate change affected resort in Victoria, it's lucky if it gets six weeks of snow, but 90% of its revenue still comes from the white season. Only 10% comes from the green season. There was a tremendous opportunity there to convince either the state government through the department that was brought for that, or the operator up there, to actually become a centre for things like hand cycles, 
and trail riders. Some and, alpine staff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some alpine staff to try and boost their, because they're close to Melbourne. Yeah. I was up at Baba two and a half years ago, just in my off-road chair, uh, before I had my hand cycle. And the guys there are were really, really excited. We're talking about the downhill stuff at Whistler and Stacey Kohai's four-wheeler. And we're quite excited, it's like, if you get this. And I was talking to them about the downhill track. And it's unlike some of the other ones that are too narrow. It's fully machine grooms. They it's groom it's beautiful. They groom it with a side-by-side, -side, so it would be fine. I'm quite keen. I haven't been up there with the uh, Explorer yet. Orwell's got real potential for a concerted effort to create a bit of a centre for excellence, training centre and so on, but it's, it's going to need some coordination with Michael Walker, yeah. the Borbore Management, the Alpine Resorts Commission, but I think there's a great opportunity there to and the, to uh, leverage and they've got a vested interest in getting yeah, some yeah. activities. Richard, I was just going to say, because you guys are the peak body for physical disability sport in mm. Victoria, is this something mm. that maybe you guys would be able to well, pull together a collaborative effort on? Well, it's quite timely. The state disability plan is currently in consultation phase, which mm. closes on July the 5th. Um, <coughs> so what they're looking for are stories of people who can demonstrate the value and, and, the, and the potential benefit of being involved in sport and what it means for people with disability. Mm. At the moment, it's, it's very much there's some token sort of commentary in, in the current discussion paper. And what what we need is, I mean, we're going to be preparing a, a submission, and, and I'll and this is a and as a, a, a component of that submission. But what it needs is stories from people who are out there who can demonstrate that this is what a change that it makes in your life mm. as a result of that participation, and that sport has to be and recreation has to be a central theme of the new state disability plan because what the plan will be. Is a guide, a guide, a guide map, a road map for the government over the next three years. Where are they going to invest investment and, and, and resources? And if an example is the redevelopment of Mount Baldwin to make it into a best case, <coughs> that was an example. Centre well, of excellence for well, then that needs to be adaptive outcomes. That idea is on current. I doubt if that idea is in anyone's head at the moment. Well, it was when Stuart Ord was up there running it when it was still a state government run thing. Stuart and I were discussing doing just that. Now the management got outsourced for five years. And Stuart went to the Northern Territory. However, the ideas are still there. Now, it's a question of who can push that. And so what it needs is, is, is a volume of feedback, not just from us at the peak body, but yeah. from all of you and all your friends and acquaintances and Facebook and whatever. It's, it's the volume of stories that demonstrate the clear benefits that is out there. Oh, the the stories exactly. need to extend out to the mountain biking clubs as well. Yep. Um, anyone involved? The issue have with like Ford and trying to get funding to do something just for summer is that other resorts will have winter as well. So if they put money into another resort that can do adaptive winter as well as adaptive summer, um, that would be probably somewhere where a government resource would be probably more likely to be funded. Because they're far superior winter resort, that's the problem. Well, that's so, right. so, you so know, the is the, uh, when you look at ancillary um, infrastructure, so accommodation and, and, and all the other things, the other resorts trump all the Well, they don't, though. From, a, from an accessibility point of view, Falls has got a problem because Falls is built on the side of the hill, the village is built on the side of the hill. So most of your lodges at Falls are split level or are difficult to get to. Howlands Gap. I mean, we put 2,000 people a year through adaptive skiing up there. Howlands Gap is, is that, but again, Orbor is looking for something to do. It should be. State government's Especially in... we can get the, end of the investment, you know, if, if it happened yeah. to be that the state government... Or well, they're funding it now. They're funding a big loss on Orbor. So anything that's going to reduce that loss is always an opportunity. It's worth exploring, isn't it? Because if you can get the funding, then... Yeah. You can yeah. Build it now. I think that's going to be the hardest. Just yeah. Yeah. how much yeah. infrastructure is actually there for the There's a couple of good lodges there that just. There's one lodge in particular, Conslet 15. The bathroom's not accessible, but it would cost less than 15000 But I went and had a look at it. It would cost less than 15000 to fix it. You've suddenly got a room that can cater with up to 15 people. So you've got the potential. Now there's no equivalent to that at Falls that can be adapted that easily. We're getting into detail, but, but yeah. you know, these are things that can be, it's an opportunity. So it sounds like that there's definitely room for a group to get together to start to look at um, at a national level, perhaps the, the the trail rating and all that kind of thing. But then, at a state level, what would it take in Victoria? What are the opportunities? What are the who, who do you need to get in the room together to to really hash out 
um, you know, the best way to provide these opportunities and the infrastructure and the information and, and, and some funding potentially. Because once it, the thing that from a government perspective, and you'll probably agree with this, is that when you get a group of people saying, we all, from these five different organisations, all are supportive of this plan, we are putting it together, it's much more likely to get funded. Um, and certainly from us, um, when we're looking at federal government stuff, doing something in partnership with another a couple of organisations at a federal level, plus showing the state stuff, it's also more successful. So I think it's worth, no ideas are off bounds. Let, let just mm -hmm. brainstorm them, come up with the ones that, that make sense and, and then see where you get the funding. Sometimes it's it's not where you expect, you know, sometimes it's not the most, the most you know, saying that falls and others may have winter and summer programs, but there may not be the ones that people are going to throw money at because they often throw money at the places that are struggling. So sometimes you can get unexpected pots of money, you know, like you're talking about. It's all good options. It may not come off, but it's got to be on the list. That's it. Um, we can help with those stories. I'm just going to move forward, guys. We've got a question here online from John, John Domald. Sorry if I got that wrong. A uh, bit of a background story and uh, question. I am vision impaired and been competing in mountain bike races for over five years on a tandem mountain bike, including 12 hour, 100 kilometer mountains to the beach and numerous small races. Last year we placed third at right in the Wollombi Wild 30. I'll take it, that's a, uh, is that right? Wollombi, is that Wollombi right? Wild 30, <laughs> I think it's some kind of mountain biking event. Venues are the biggest problem, you know, things with accommodation, I'm sure that's uh, what he's referring to. But I have found event, organize, event organizers have adjusted course system to accommodate my tandem or allowed B lines through some, some sections. One of the main issues is numbers. It would be fantastic to see more tandems out there as well. Mm -hmm. Thoughts? Um, I know in WA um, there has been a very small group. Uh, in, with, um, I forgot the name of the organisation, but Tandem WA. They've, uh, they're mainly road tandem cyclists, but they um, have uh, a small group of people that do the offer and stuff. And the reason I included a photo of that at the beginning was because in terms of, you know, B-Lines is a great example of a way of adapting uh, a race course or a trail, you know, whether it be for events, uh, for competitions or just recreational. Uh, it's just a matter of, you know, it's a real simple, just create a beeline, you know, a couple of extra meters of trails or slightly modify um, an obstacle. Um, I'd like to see personally uh, more uh, tandem bikes because they can do some pretty cool stuff. Um, and in terms of space requirements, dimensions and trail building, it's very similar to the trikes that we ride. So I think if we can collaborate uh, with people from the vision impaired community as well, I think that gives us even a louder voice as well. And yeah, look, the more groups involved, I think the better. Andrew, do you aware, is this something that Blind Sport Australia get involved with, or are there specific groups with this? Because obviously we don't cover yeah. that. Look, not my area, and I have mm. been trying to get in touch with someone to sort of speak on their behalf, and you know. I might follow that up yeah. with them to see whether yeah, they've got absolutely. any yeah. Another one. <laughs> another <laughs> um, <laughs> question from Thanks Dan. for the question. We can follow up. Um, Follow up to see what Dan's got a suggestion here for keeping motorbikes down from um, WA. Keeping motorbikes off mountain biking accessible trails would be a U shaped post like commonly used on paths around the city, just high enough for a trike to pass under. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> so we'll sneak in on the bikes It's possible. Yeah. Yeah. Mountain bikes can easily pass through between them. Mountain bikes can't. You know, that, that's a very technical thing, and the sort of things that we need to really talk about, and mm. you know, eliminate some of those problems. And yeah, the same issues in WA as well. There's uh, access barrier gates that are preventing them, or there are gates that are open to the public, but they're you know too narrow. Or you run a design competition so or something. Like that. That's yeah. it. Yeah. 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 You know, well, everyone from the there's heaps of design and industrial design organisations at universities. There's one on this field which. The other yeah. part of this is that, that how we, we take our bikes around because the, the, the big things in not everyone wants to use a trailer or has a trailer so yeah. so I, I mean just to, you know um, I, I reckon I'll there's send, more I'll send you a link. I'd like to see some more there's, there's, ideas. A free, there's actually a trike okay. Beautiful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, um, it yeah. goes on the roof with suction trucks. Oh, yeah. send that to us yeah. as well. We'll leave that through to Adam. Yeah. 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 Ye
There's a lovely powered bridge here. Yeah, yeah. There's also adapted bike racks which sit on your tow ball at the end. We can well, there's a few different things. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but they, these are the things that we need to talk about, you know, on sort of low level and then feed these things up <coughs> to these groups that we put together and, you know, develop these, these guidelines and really push it forward. So. Um, any final remarks before we have a quick break? Have a bit of a <coughs> get straight into demo. I've got one more. The biggest thing <coughs> I have awesome success riding my trike around this hill. Yep. The only, uh, the, the biggest obstacle I can, this feels good because it's a steady gradient, it's not too steep, so you don't run into that off camera, tip that up sort of stuff too often. But the biggest problem I have is there's little plastic bridges which have been built just to go over areas which flood or whatever. Mm. And uh, that, that line, yeah, uh, yeah, like a few centimetres too short, yeah. Yeah. So I, I guess that's the sort of standard we need to have a look at yeah. to say minimum minimum width yeah. 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 and it's not very far off what they've got existing the yeah. trail building guidelines it, it's just making a slight yeah. modification so you're not right on the edges yeah. that's it you know there's been a few times where I've nearly <laughs> missed you know dropping two meters that sort of feedback's really good for us as well because those culverts are really really important mm. to divert water off the tracks which means yeah. the track stay in better condition. So if it's just a matter of increasing that, that much on each side to make it easier for you guys, feed that information back to us so that we can actually act on it when we've got budget yeah. to do that. That was my question. How do I get that feedback and really get to given there's trial builders, there's private property, there's state government property, there's parks? With, in terms of, I can only speak on behalf of Parks Victoria, we have our central phone number, which is our 13 1963, so it's relatively easy for people to remember. Yeah. So if you actually con if you actually call that number and ask to be transferred through to Mr. Field, they'll put you straight through the Mr. Field staff and then they can actually put the, get you in contact with the correct person to speak to about getting those culverts modified with the Mr. Field Park. Well, wouldn't it be great though if that's something that happens in multiple parks, is there a way that perhaps even if it's through um, Disability Sport and Rec we can put together some suggestions from the group that would be helpful to say so that you've got one centralised thing rather than individuals because also people if one person contacts historically our experiences that they don't necessarily get listened to yeah, well, unless they happen to get the right what you need is things to local government which yeah. we're starting to formalise with yeah. Parks and Leisure Australia because yeah. they, they tend to be the I've worked in local government 10 years so I understand yeah. how local government works so that's a, yeah. a connection with them because it's not just Parks Victoria mm. it's all so maybe however there is a thing on the Parks Victoria website which does get action there is a wiki so put it there because Ken Wright will read it. Yeah. And what, I was, what, I was what, it, what the rest of the organisations like is to form that relationship with, with John so that the feedback generally coming into parks on trials somehow gets fed back into other information. Because oh. you're right, what's applicable to Parks Victoria's assets will be applicable to others. Yeah, so I think rather than the suggestion coming from Michael Forbes who rides a trike. It would be great if we had a body we could report into mm. who could then contact the appropriate people to say, hey, we've got this trial, it's great, it's this, it's that, but this corner's too sharp, this burn's too steep, or whatever. <coughs> could we, you know what I mean? So that yeah. it's, so a, some, it's a yeah. body that we go to as mm. trail users. I so think so that I trail think that is so, so I'm probably putting Richard on the spot here, but as the sort of the peak body in Victoria, is it something that Disability support and rate could perhaps be that conduit. Well, we probably don't have that role at the moment, but I think but logically it makes sense mm. for us to take on. Is that, that something role. that people within Victoria, mm. um, because there's not a state mountain bike here, is it? Is it? Does it make at sense that maybe it's in the first instance, yeah, yeah, you yeah. guys at in at disability support and maybe coordinate people's efforts? So are you got like is that would that make sense in Victoria for mm. for you guys to be that sort of coordinating body for the interest group or the reference group within Victoria? Mm pull together the feedback, maybe, is that something that makes yeah. sense no, I mean, we've got steering groups in WA, so yeah. everyone sort of comes to me with the adaptive yeah. stuff and then I can feed that through to you and they're, you know, same thing to all the other states. Yeah. And, yeah. 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 Oh, if it from, makes sense, it, yeah. it, it, rather than just sort of going away from here going, well, we still don't know who's the point of contact, maybe yeah. if we feed stuff through to well, just... Maybe if we you know, we've got all the contact details from people yeah. who are here. You can maybe send me the, the, the terms of reference of the, the group that you've got mm. in WA. It's okay, here's a starting point. Mm. 
I mean, we're just forming a, a group of um, disability state sporting bodies, you know, blind sports and sports. We're, we're, we're at the first meeting of that this week. So we're, we're doing that role of bringing people together to try and have a coordinated voice that then needs to get fed to the right appropriate channels. Because you're all linked in through... That's the most logical point. Oh uh, yeah, and, yeah, and that's what's missing, I think, because yeah. I, you know, we've been doing our little stuff in our area, and yeah. people have been doing individual stuff, and mm. you know, you've been doing some. So yeah, that'd be great, and that way, yeah, you know, if people have got an interest, they can call DSR and DSR can bring their free hand cycles they've just bought down to the rehab centre, and you know. Yeah, but also DSR, you can link with parks, you link with yeah. everybody, yeah. and then you can link with us nationally too, which then. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. And that, that that's one, one point to highlight is a lot of the trail networks are constructed and maintained by clubs. Mm -hmm. So the landowner may be Queensland Parks and Wildlife or Forestry New South Wales, but the responsibility for maintaining and constructing a lot mm -hmm. of it is, is you know, there's an MOU or a partnership mm -hmm. with a club. So I think there needs to be that education process mm -hmm. coupled with you know what we're talking about here down to the club level, mm -hmm. which is where I suppose the standards and all of the the uh, liaison that we're talking about. Um, so, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm in the club in from Queensland, but um, if, if my small core, core group of people then needed to take on this extra, um, it's not responsibility, but, but we need to be educated mm -hmm. on, you know, we've got 15 kilometres of trail that we've built in, in six months, 12 months, but then how do we make sure, or how do we and make sure that we can accommodate people on mm -hmm. road hands. And it's so up to us to bring that together and mm -hmm. present that through the standards as well. That would be what you'd want as a user is a body mm -hmm. that you can go to who then you know, places it up on your behalf. Mm -hmm. or I mean, I'd love to do it, but I've got a full-time job and just the resources. Look, I think yeah, we've got a coalition of people that have yeah. interests, so as long as you've kind of got some points, rather than just be 25 different people doing different things, if everyone's sort of coordinating through a couple of points that are talking to each other, it's not the end solution, but at least it's maybe the next step. Um, so that, you know, if you've got a club in Victoria, for example, that's interesting, then you know that mm. you link them with disability yeah. support work in the first instance, and they bring that community together, maybe. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And, you know, I've seen some really wonderful inclusion departments in, in mainstream sporting organisations, state sporting organisations, but I've also seen some, some that are a bit of an add-on on the yeah, side, so, right. so the fact that you're here and you're, you're wanting to, to mm -hmm. learn if we can help and make it mm -hmm. an easy kind of, and be of assistance as well, that, that'll yeah. integrate it better. Yeah. And I think that, that, that would be appreciated and yeah. Yeah, very important yeah. in this yeah. process yeah. that those partnerships established. And certainly that, that whole idea of mainstreaming where the mainstream sport takes over the sport, it can be great and it's a, it's a philosophy the Sports Commission are keen on, but mm. we were talking at the break about how there's no measurement of that, no one's actually evaluated to see if it's effective or what make it, makes it effective and our experience is that working, having a disability community or disability sport community working in partnership with a mainstream organisation in a really collaborative way mm. is the that thing that we found most successful. So I think we're off to a great start. Yeah. Okay. I think we'll wrap things up. Um, we've gone over time with the uh, panel, but um, look, uh, thank you for everyone being here and awesome feedback from everyone. Thank you for, for all the presenters here. If you, you know, some of you have flown here for this. I uh, really appreciate it. Um, I don't know what to say. That's just something to take on board, but at least the discussion has started. I think that's the main thing, and we all know who each other are, and you know we know where to go for information and resources. But I think uh, I guess the main thing we've we've come about is that we need uh, I guess someone to represent uh, the disability community in terms of trails and off-road uh, cycling and things like that. So. Um, thank you again for everyone, and um, special thanks for the hosts here, um, the Bruce Sports and Rec. Again, um, I'd like to see this happen uh, around Australia, hopefully on an annual basis. We go around to each state so that we add a bit of a local zing to it and see how different states operate, and I think that will help uh, bring things up together again. And maybe, you know, maybe run it twice a year, maybe at the beginning at the end. It's up for discussion. Uh, you know, if the support's there from anyone, uh, it's definitely welcome. I mean, I sort of tapped into just the end of my basketball um, weekend, so very limited to the amount of travel that I can do, but, you know, where we can, you know, it's, it's awesome to just be here in person. And, you know, there's technology to help us spread the message out there. There's Skype, there's mm -hmm. YouTube, there's Twitter, there's a whole bunch of things. So uh, spread the word with everyone. If, you know, anyone is interested, um, feel free to contact me and I can pass you on to any one of these people. Feel free to contact Richard. Um, 
and yeah get the word out there and just keep writing I guess <laughs> that's the main thing so thank you again and well done everyone yeah. A bit of a if anyone goes or for some people might be leaving, I'm not sure. Um, so there's some lunch, I think. And then